Okay, we have begun the recording. This welcome to uh, there uh, to Mayim Chaim Beit Midrash. This is the Joshua Survey, Session Six. <clears throat> I'm Dave LeBlanc, and uh, this is a live class. There's several people on right now. More to join, but if you're watching this live or if you're watching this on recording, this is going to be a really fun. Hey, Katie, a fun class really deep water we're going to go into today and hopefully this is going to be a good discussion that we have because I believe that uh, this really is a very powerful uh, chapter in the Tanakh. So we're going to cover Joshua chapter 7. We might get into chapter 8 uh, maybe in the beginning couple of verses although probably not. So I got plenty of material here. And if I know I have plenty of material, that means I probably have too much material. So it's unlikely we're going to do any more than Chapter 7. But there's enough here in Chapter 7 uh, from the sages that should keep us uh, dutifully entertained. Uh, very, very exciting information tonight uh, to, to dive into and discuss. I want to start off the class by reading uh, the, f the first 12 verses of the chapter, just so we have it in our minds so we understand the commentary as we dive into it. <clears throat> hey, honey. So the first 12 verses, reading from the Judaica commentary, read as follows. It says, the children of Israel committed a trespass in the consecrated thing. Now, just remember, the end of chapter 6 is the Lord telling uh, us that the, that the Lord was with Joshua, and Joshua's fame was spreading throughout the land. Okay, this is the last thing we've read at the end of chapter seven. But now we have this, uh, the, 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 the conquering of Jericho is complete. And of course we remember from the last chapter, uh, Jericho was consecrated. It was dedicated to the Lord, dedicated to destruction as it were. And uh, Joshua told the people not to take any spoil because the, 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 the city was, was consecrated, it was set apart for the Lord as a first fruits. That's what we learned. So now we're going to get a twist. We're going to get a little bit of a twist to the story. In this chapter, we're going to deal with some stuff that, that begs some very powerful questions of us regarding atonement and national identity. So beginning chapter 7, it says, The children of Israel committed a trespass in the consecrated thing. For Achan, or Achan, however you would choose to say it, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the consecrated thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of, hey, Rabbi. Welcome. Hi, how you doing, all? Great, great to have you on. Hey, Eric. I wasn't sure if you were going to make it. I didn't know if the time schedule was going to work for you. I may have to leave uh, a little early, um, and obviously with apologies in advance. <laughs> well, that's okay, because the, the subject matter I'm covering tonight is a little beyond my pay grade, so it might be better for me if you're not listening to me as I step all over my own feet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, object to that okay, characterization yeah. from the very beginning. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Fair enough, fair enough. A little, a little uh, misplaced humility there. All right, so I just began reading Chapter 7. We're going to cover Chapter 7 tonight, and I was just introducing the class uh, saying that there's some really fascinating material here uh, in this particular chapter dealing with um, uh, issues of atonement, national identity, uh, really fascinating stuff that I think, uh, I think is really worth diving into uh, because there's so much, uh, there's so much confusion, or I, I shouldn't even say confusion, although that's true, but just different conceptions between different religious expressions about what atonement is, what it means, what forgiveness of sin looks like, the ideas of uh, you know concepts such as we, we have these these uh, nuclearly loaded words like atonement and redemption and salvation and all the, this uh, this collateral of linguistics that just gets tossed around uh, and and really a lot of times without proper understanding and context of what it really means biblically uh, and especially in relation to the nation of Israel particularly. So we're going to see some of that tonight, which is what I was introducing uh, a couple of moments ago. And I wanted to read the first 12 uh, verses of the chapter just to kind of put 
all this in context so we understand what, what's being discussed here. So we, we had verse one was the, uh, the, committed a, the committing of a trespass and the consecrated thing. And as I mentioned, the consecrated thing was related to taking the spoils from the conquering of Jericho. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is, and Rabbi, I'm going to ask you to help me with pronunciation if I mess any of these things up. I, I always call it I, because mm -hmm. it sounds like artificial intelligence, which I like, which is beside. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's how it is. Yeah, that's how okay, true. good. Uh, on the east side of Bethel and spoke to them saying, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out I, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not let all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite I. Do not trouble all the people there, for they are but few. So there went up of there of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of I. And the men of I smote of them about 36 men, and they chased them from before the gate uh, to Shabaram. And smote them in the desert, in the, in the descent, excuse me. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothing and fell to the earth upon his face, face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust upon their heads. Joshua said, Woe, O Lord God, why have you at all brought this people over the Jordan? Deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to cause us to perish. Uh, would that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. Pray, O Lord, what shall I say after Israel has turned their backs from before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear and it shall encircle us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? And the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you fall upon your face? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. And they have also taken of the consecrated thing and have also stolen and also dissembled. And they have also put into their vessels and the children of Israel shall not be able to stand before their enemies. They will turn their backs before their enemies because they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore. If you do not destroy the consecrated thing from among you, I'm going to stop reading there. Um, a lot of twists and turns and unexpected monkey wrenches are going to get put into this, uh, narrative. I'm going to ask anybody that's not muted if you can mute yourself uh, unless you have a comment just to reduce the background noise. Uh, we're getting some thumping and, and different things going on. So um, so let's look into the commentary here. Uh, here's a key point that really is going to be the overarching theme of this particular study tonight is that all of Israel is considered one body, one soul. And I want to quote uh, the commentary of the Malbin here. Uh, it says, each individual, a limb or organ of the, of the whole, a transgression of one renders the entire organism, organism vulnerable. Thus, a Khan Sin was responsible for the withdrawal of divine providence from the army of Israel, causing its defeat and the loss of 36 men. That number 36 is very significant. Although these 36 were not guilty of trespass, and a Khan was, since they were in the face of danger without the Almighty's protection, they fell in battle. Another note here that I wanted to share was that the, the Mazudath David, which is a collection of writings that I'm not familiar with, but I'm quoting it nonetheless, says that Israel in general was negligent in guarding the spoils from causing defilement. Therefore, all were guilty of Achan's, Achan's or Achan's trespass. So in other words, uh, there was some negligence associated with, with the protection or guarding or, or oversight of the spoils, the booty, as it were, uh, of the conquering of Jericho. But let's go into verse 5. We, we looked at these first 12 verses. I mentioned the number 36 being significant. Because we're dealing now with, uh, there should be a question arising in all of our minds here that certainly arose in the minds of the sages, that we have the sin of one individual, which has now affected the entire nation, to where the nation now lacks protection and blessing in battle. And righteous people lost their lives now as a result of this this is what they're telling us so this verse verse 5 says and the men of i smote of them about 36 men the sages tell us that these were very righteous men 
and they parallel the Sanhedrin, the gathering of the great assembly of uh, those who judge the nation. The Sefrei Deuteronomy says, although they had transgressed the ban, the prayer of, this is interesting, the prayer of Abraham, who had anticipated the battle, saved them from great loss. That's fascinating. So we have this concept now. We have two overlapping meta themes that seem to be just coming out of nowhere. We had, we had this wonderful victory over Jericho. Everything's going great. The covenant's being established, ratified. People are entering into their promise. And now all of a sudden we have this unexpected, not only a defeat, a tragedy of mammoth proportions that these righteous men that were handpicked would die in battle. For what reason? Because of sin in the camp. But the sages tell us that it would have been far worse had Abraham not prayed for the people on behalf, uh, excuse me, on their behalf, way in advance of this battle. This is what the sages tell us. And of course, that isn't possible to be true unless all of Israel is connected. This is something that's very, very challenging for people who have been raised in Christianity to understand. Because within Protestantism, of course, those of us who have come out of that, we were taught that everything related to our relationship with God is really based on an individual relationship. It's an individual me to God thing. And that I'm judged for my own sin only, and I'm not really connected to the deeds of other people. But yet, even within Christianity, which teaches that people are saved, quote unquote, through their belief in this one person, there has to be an idea of a connectivity of souls. Otherwise, there can't be any kind of a redemptive work done on anyone's behalf. So what we find is interesting is that we don't have within Judaism this Christian idea of a human sacrifice for other people. But we do have the idea of righteous men interceding with God on behalf of the people. We have the idea of the righteous, of the Zadokim, providing a form of protection and atonement for the collective whole of the Jewish people. And we see this talked about with Abraham. We also see this, even if we were to look at the New Testament, uh, I, you know, I say the New Testament, that's what it's called, but the writings of the, of the Christian Bible, uh, James 5.16 says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. So even in the Christian Bible, we see this principle being promoted. I wanted to share something really important uh, along these lines. I wanted to share something real quick from the introduction to Lakute Maharan, which is the magnus opus of Rebbe uh, Nachman of Breslov. In lesson five of Lakute Maharan, we see something really, really interesting related to what we heard about with Abraham. So in, uh, in the notes introducing this, uh, this lesson, it says that Rebbe Nachman taught this lesson, and, and the key verse of the lesson I should share with you, the key verse of Lesson 5 of Lakute Maharan is Psalm 98.6, which says, With trumpets and the sound of the shofar, shout out before God the King. I thought that was interesting because we just went through this whole thing with Jericho. And it says, Rebbe Nachman taught this lesson uh, on Rosh Hashanah, shortly after he had taken up residence in Breslov. Um, the main themes of the lesson are mitigating decrees, performing the mitzvot with joy, and the reward for the mitzvot, intense prayer, cleansing one's minds of mind of undesirable thoughts, and strife between the righteous. Um, so interestingly, uh, it says, uh, according to uh, his disciples, it says that at the time that Rebbe Nachman gave this lesson, 
decrees against the Jewish people were very much an issue in the Jewish communities under Tsarist rule. Being considered were several new enactments by the Tsar's Committee for the Amelioration, if I said that right, of the Jews. In time, these decrees would lead to enforced secular education, the Cantonist edicts, and ultimately to the establishment of the Pale of Jewish Settlement. In 1802, the Jewish leadership convened to seek ways to avert these disastrous decrees. Their efforts, however, were met with such re much resistance, in particular because the support of the Russian government received uh, from the burgeoning Jewish Enlightenment movement known as the Haskalah. Rab Nachman of, of Tekeren, I think, I heard, says, I heard from my father, that Reb Nachman hinted at the time that the verdict had already been issued in heaven. Even so, the Rebbe worked an entire year to somehow mitigate these decrees. Several other of the Rebbe's lessons uh, given in the year 5563 also relate to this concept of mitigating decrees. Some of the other uh, Hasidim remember the Rebbe commenting that if all the Zadakim would join me in this, I could overturn these decrees completely. As it is, I've pushed them off for some 20 odd years. And this turned out to be exactly what happened. It wasn't until after the Rebbe died, or shortly before he died, that these decrees were finally enacted. So the, the teaching then is that the prayer of a Zadik can actually protect the people from harm. And, you know, none of us here sitting in this room, I don't think, qualify as a Zadik. However, we can still pray for each other. And we can even pray for those, believe it or not, that don't agree with us, which is really amazing. <laughs> we can even pray for people that we don't think deserve God's protection. And amazingly, when we have this idea kind of flowing through our consciousness, this fact that we're actually connected to one another, that our souls are actually joined at some level, uh, it, it makes us a little bit less quick to wag our finger and blame everybody else for the problem. And this is, I think, one of the things that we're learning from this is the fact that, yes, Achan committed this trespass, but as, as the sages analyze the situation, we're going to see as we go forward here that there's more than just him that's being dealt with in this in ways that we would not ever expect. Uh, you know, it's, it's the old adage, you know, you point one finger forward, you get three coming back at you. And that's really what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the idea that we have to be sensitive to the fact that whether we agree with people, whether we share their politics, whether we, whether we share their religion even, we really are, as a human race, all connected at some level. And the Jewish people particularly are connected to each other. And that's true throughout history. You know, it's, it's funny because uh, I think... Uh, those of us who approach Judaism, where our, our entrance point to looking at the Jewish people is strictly through a religious lens, and we don't consider the cultural, ethnic uh, diversity of the Jewish people as a whole, we tend to dismiss that, that dynamic. We look at things strictly from a religious perspective, and we don't realize that, that every Jew is a Jew, and they're all family, whether they are religious or not. And in the same way, as we look out, it, wouldn't it be a lot healthier for us to look at our fellow members of the human race, not as that person's the enemy and this one's part of the solution, but that everyone must be part of the solution at some level. Because if everyone's not part of the solution at some level, we don't get to go where we're going. Because if we're all riding in a boat together and there's a leak in the boat, it doesn't matter who sprung the leak. What matters is we got to fix the leak. Otherwise, we're all going to go down, right? And this is sometimes what causes despair when we, when we try to encompass in our brain the, the totality and the breadth of the problems that we're dealing with. It can be overwhelming. And the reason it's overwhelming is there isn't any one individual on the planet that's responsible to fix all the problems. No one person has all the solutions or all the ideas. Joshua is going to see something here even as a great leader of, of God's people, he's going to learn an important lesson in this, which is uh, far be it for me to say that, but this is what the sages say as they analyze this.
So we see this dual thing. We see this concept where, where the sin of one affects the whole, but the, the prayer of one can also affect the whole, the righteousness of one. And we're also going to see how uh, Jeremy says, to love a fellow Jew is to love God, for it is written, you are children of God, Deuteronomy 14.1. When one loves the father, one loves his children. Uh, aphorism of the bell. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Thank you, Jeremy. So let me move on here. So it says in verse 6 that when, when this is learned, this tragedy, Joshua rends his clothing. I want to read you a lot of tonight's lesson is going to be uh, centered around a passage of Talmud uh, from Tractate Sanhedrin uh, from 43 through 44. Uh, we're going to be reading various portions of this as we seek to understand this chapter. I think the, it's really a rich, rich section. So this is going to be our first reading here. Uh, so this idea of Joshua rending his clothing. And the first reading, if I can get to it, is this right here. So it says, and this is from uh, uh, Sanhedrin 44, first side. Rabbi Nahima, Himia said to him, and does God ever punish the nation as a whole for hidden sins committed by individuals? But isn't it already stated that hidden matters belong to the Lord our God forever, indicating that the Jewish people will never be collectively held responsible for the secret sins of individuals? Rather, the dots over the words teach that just as God did not ever punish the nation as a whole for hidden sins committed by individuals, so too he did not punish the entire nation for sins committed publicly by individuals until, until the Jewish people crossed the Jordan River. The Gemara asks, and I wanted to say that, you know, this is something that's interesting that um, uh, Jeremy also shares, hold on, he says, I find it interesting that Joshua reacts so strongly to the deaths of 36. Uh, the deaths of 30 was assigned. Well, also the fact, yes, yeah, that's very true, Joshua, uh, excuse me, Jeremy, what you're saying there, and also the fact that it represented uh, a really big loss of righteousness, uh, that it was, a, it was equivalent of a Sanhedrin, is what they teach us. In fact, it's right here in this Talmud section. Uh, but yeah, it's a good comment. So it goes on. I wanted to say something real quick that, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we, people talk about, uh, like I talk about conversion, right? But understand that, you know, it's not a flippant thing. You know, when, when, you're, when you're choosing to take on uh, an identity, that identity comes with responsibility. You know, you don't just convert because, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to hang a new flag on the front of my house now. It's just that simple. Just put up this little thing, stick a pole in there, and bang, done, finished. Well, that's the way it is for other religions. You can just say, I'm changing religions. I'm going to confess this now. Judaism is not like that. Judaism is you're, you're joining a people. It's not just a religion. You're joining a people. So there's more to it than that. And I'm going to learn about that. Am I not? I'm going to learn about that firsthand. So, but this is a big deal. So now we have this idea that the Jewish people are crossing the Jordan River. And now that they've crossed into the covenant promise, a different level of accountability is now in place. Lo and behold, they're not in the wilderness anymore. Now hidden things are going to be revealed. Why? Because they're collectively embracing the promise of the covenant, which we already learned in the Torah. Those promises have both blessings and curses associated with them. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings the results of the curse. Anyways, so it says, but if so, reading the Talmud again, what is the reason that in the case of Akan or Achan, they were punished? The Gemara answers, Akan's offense was not a hidden matter because his wife and children knew about it, and they did not protest. Why do they say that? Because it makes it a public thing. It says, this follows the rule in the notes here, that a matter known to three people is considered to be public knowledge. Okay? So it goes on and says, when God explained to Joshua the reason for the Jewish people's defeat at the city of Ai, he said, Israel has sinned. Joshua 7.11, Rabbi Abar Bazavda says, from here it may be inferred that even when the Jewish people have sinned, they are still called Israel. Rabbi Abba says this is in accordance with the adage that people say, even when a myrtle is found among thorns, its name is myrtle and people call it myrtle. The verse in Joshua continues, they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have also taken of the dedicated property and also stolen and also dissembled and also put it among their own goods. Uh, Rabbi Aliyah, 
says in the name of Rabbi Yehuda Bar Masparda, this teaches that Akan also transgressed all five books of the Torah, as the word also is stated here five times. All right, that's that's pretty heavy stuff. Any comments? But so I'm just going to uh, take one moment. I, unfortunately, I have to leave, so it's a oh, okay. for me. I will uh, I will listen to the rest of it. I I, I just want to throw one thing in, and then maybe I'll catch back up with you and see uh, if if it, how the conversation goes. But um, part of what's so powerful about this is that we are all connected when we sort of open our hearts to that connection or in, in the Rabbi Nachman piece, it's the, it's the voice of the shofar. But the, when we're all connected for bad, when we're all connected through a Khan, even though it seems like, you know, the whole point is, wait a minute, this happened so, you know, unfairly or so, so easily. Um, it, it almost looks like the text is going out of its way to say, that's not the way it should be. Right there should be all sorts of ways to to block that. Mm. And what is interesting is the part that you read before we got to Achan was that their hearts melted. Right there, there's something about the hearts melting that happens, and then the suffering happens to to everyone. Um, and it's almost like the heart melting is the opposite of you know the buoyancy of 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 the shofar. And, yeah. and that's like their protection. The 36 righteous who could have done it all, you know, that's the heart melting. And um, for some part of this, I think it's, you know, it's not parallel. We're not connected for good the same way we're connected for bad. We're connected to good in a more powerful way than the sort of consequences that happen. It takes more for us to be connected for, for bad. That's an um, interesting point. Yeah. So anyway, I, yeah. I, 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 sorry, I can't stay for longer, but um, Thank you for joining I, really, I, yeah. I love, I love this take on, on, on the story and it's a great, uh, you know, the Gemara really gives you a lot to, to think about because they, they, they take this very positive view. Israel, Shafel, Pisha, Chatai, Israel, who a Jew, even when they sin, you know, is still a Jew. All right. right. Thank you for your time, Rabbi. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Okay, enjoy your evening. Balatov. Thank you. Well, that was that was sweet. That was great. I'm glad he uh, had a chance to to share something there. Um, any anyone else before I move on to the rest of my notes there that wants to chime in while we're uh, while we're chiming? No, Eric. Okay, I'll move on. I got plenty of notes. So Joshua fell on his face upon uh, before the ark. This is very interesting. The sages tell us that this act is the origin of the practice of reciting the Takanun prayer while reclining, but only before a Sefer scroll. And it's very, very interesting. I didn't know this until I studied this. I wanted to read to you guys something real quick. Uh, what are they talking about? For those who aren't, aren't familiar with the Takanun prayer, uh, I wanted to read you Rabbi Sachs's notes from uh, the Koran Sidur on this prayer, which is pleading with God. This section of the prayer is known as Takanun, which is plea and is a return to private prayer, which began with the silent Amida. The Siddur preserves a careful balance between the two ways in which we address God as individuals with our personal hopes and fears and as members of a community whose fate and aspirations we share. First, we pray individually, the silent Amida, and then uh, communally, the leader's repetition, then individually in Tachanun again. Knowing that our time in the direct presence of the Supreme King of Kings is drawing to an end, we approach him directly, seeking as it were a private audience. Our voices drop, we whisper our deepest thoughts, we express our feelings of inadequacy and vulnerability. We know we are unworthy. We say nothing in our defense except that we have absolute faith in God. The, ta the, the word tachanun derives from the root uh, uh, hen, n, n, meaning to show favor, 
to be gracious or nun nun, uh, to forgive. What differentiates tachanun from other modes of prayer is the extent to which we emphasize our failings and our lack of good deeds. We express our dependence on God's unconditional grace and mercy. Takanun is the chamber music rather than the symphony, symphony of the soul, and it has a unique intensity of tone. So that, I just wanted to share that because, you know, uh, when we deal with liturgy, uh, sometimes I think um, liturgy can be viewed as just nothing but this formal thing that uh, many evangelicals particularly uh, uh, chafe at the concept of formal liturgy because it, it seems to rob you of, of the aspect of personal spontaneity in prayer. But nothing could be further from the truth, actually. When you have a roadmap uh, of reverence, when you have a roadmap of approaching Hashem, uh, approaching the throne uh, through, a, through an ordered reverence, uh, an ordered uh, an order, uh, what happens is it actually frees you to be more spontaneous because uh, the formality of, of the beautiful prayers that are within the liturgy uh, give you the framework uh, to be able to concretize your thoughts as you're trying to approach uh, Hashem. Whereas, you know, before I learned liturgy, uh, and I'm still learning, uh, you know, prayer was always the most weak, the weakest part of my faith because I never knew what to say. I mean, what do you say before uh, an omnipotent God when you're frustrated and don't know what to do with yourself? I mean, what, where do you begin? And, and furthermore, why do I have to open my mouth and say anything at all? Doesn't he know everything already? Doesn't he already know what's in my head? You know, this is, these are the kind of thoughts that, you, that go through your mind. And so you have to learn prayer. You have to learn what it's like to confess with your mouth and bring forth the sacrifice of praise, as it were. You have to bring it forth. You have to bring forth an offering from your lips and, and from your heart in, in, in Kavanah, right? This isn't a prayer teaching, but, but basically the Takanun prayer is a prayer of personal reflection. And so this is what is reflected here with Joshua. Joshua, as the leader of the people, he goes by himself before the ark and, and falls on his face before it. Just, he's an answer. Just personally, just crying out, to God. Rent his clothing. It says in verse 6 also that he and the elders of Israel put dust upon their heads. It says here in an interesting note, uh, both Gershonides and Rashi uh, comment on this, saying that the only reason our father Abraham built an altar on this site was so that his children would not fall here in battle. Think about that. Again, Another reflection by the rabbis on the connectivity, not just of the souls living today, but every Jewish soul is connected to every other Jewish soul that has ever been. When, when a, a young woman or a man makes their bar or bat mitzvah, they're making a confession that they are standing in the present tense with the generation that stood at Sinai and making affirmation that they will hear and they will do. It's, it's, a, it's a dynamic that we have to understand, that our faith is present. It's this day. But this day right now connects us to every generation that has been. And when you really think about it, we're going to cover this really in depth when we get back into Derek Hashem. But the idea that all souls on the planet come originally from Adam Rishon, so before there was even Jews, there was a collective soul which, from which emanates the entire human race. This is a mind-blowing concept. Whether you're Kabbalistic or not, you have to admit that all the blood that flows through every human being on the planet has its origin in the first man and woman. You don't have to be a Kabbalist to admit that. that that's just science. That's just fact. So, therefore, we're all connected. Okay. So Abraham built an altar here. And the sages say that it was so that his children would not fall in battle. So imagine if Abraham had not had the Ruach, the consciousness, to be able to pray at that level. The vision as, a, as, as an Av, the vision of, of prophecy to be able to anticipate. We know, we know from the text 
that when the cutting of the covenant with Abraham happened, that Abraham went into a deep, dark slumber during which the sages tell us he envisioned and saw the suffering of his descendants. He saw them go into slavery in Egypt. He saw it. It deeply bothered him. So Abraham was not, uh, was not, um, the word escapes me that I'm trying to think of. He, he wasn't uh, unfamiliar with the pain of knowing that things weren't always going to go the way that he hoped. He knew. Uh, I think sometimes that's God's chesed to us, is that he doesn't tell us everything that's going to happen. You know, we, we're able to live in, in this kind of uh, insulated bubble of optimism sometimes, when if we really knew what was coming <laughs> throughout the whole journey that we're about to take, we'd be like, that's it, I, 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 I'm checking out now. Where's my punch card? I'm done. I'm not done with that, no way. But yet we go through it, don't we? We've been through stuff in our past that we would never have signed up for intentionally. And yet we went through it, didn't we? And here we are, we're still, we're still standing today by the, by the grace of Hashem. We still carried through because if we had had the choice to make, we would not have made that choice and we would not have had our faith grow. Um, Rabbi Manus Friedman tells a beautiful story about this point. Um, maybe if I have time later, I'll share it, but uh, really it's very, it's actually a, a blessing uh, from, from Hashem that we don't know, but the greatest men and women of Israel's history have been given these types of visions. They've seen what's coming, both good and bad. And what's even more painful is that the prophets of Israel's history have seen what's coming and yet have been rejected when they've tried to proclaim it. They haven't been accepted in that message. Later on, they were accepted, but the generation that they speak it to oftentimes don't want to hear it. Well, sometimes they do, but... Um, all right. Verse 7, going back to the text. Would that we would have been content on the other side of the Jordan. Here's a proclamation being made by Joshua. Very similar. You guys will remember that Moses said something very similar, didn't he? When he was wrestling with Pharaoh, right? He was like, why did you send me to these people? Their situation is far worse now than before I showed up. You know, what are you going to do about this? The people are rejecting me. I, I, you know, we, we've become a, mock, a mockery. Pharaoh's making their lives much more difficult. It can look that way. We, we step into something that we think, surely this is God's will. Surely this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. And then all hell breaks loose, literally. And it seems like, you know, those around us who know us murmur under their breath thinking, well, that wasn't the Lord, obviously. Look at the train wreck they're in the midst of. That couldn't have been God's will. Look at the mess their family's in. Really think they're following God? Think they're really hearing from God? Look at the, look at the trouble. Well, you know, the servants of God go through trouble. And like we've already discussed here in this chapter, don't think selfishly that these people that you care about, you know, they stepped into doing this, this mighty act. They tried to do some great thing and their whole life seemingly falls apart. Their life might be falling apart for you partially. They might be taking it on the chin for your sake. So you don't have to. Because that's the principle here. The principle here is that we're all connected. Don't be, don't be proud and arrogant when everything's going well and your business is cranking and, and, you, and you can afford the big house upgrade and you can buy the fancy car and your kids get to go to the choice school and think, oh, God is blessing us because we're so righteous. And those poor people over there that are languishing in poverty, there must be some sin that they just haven't dealt with. Don't think that way. Because that poor person over there that struggles every single day, you don't know, but you might not be qualified to carry their sandals in the spiritual realm. You just don't know. I'm not saying it's always the case, because certainly it's not always the case, but we, we can't judge each other that way. And we can't lift ourselves up in that way, nor should we denigrate ourselves in that way. It's very challenging to not think less of yourself when things are going poorly. And it's very hard to remain humble when it seems like everything you touch turns to gold. 
success can be just as much of a, of a challenge to your spiritual life as failure. You know, there's, there was an old adage I learned a long time ago that, uh, that, you know, if, if, if you can't, if you can't learn your lesson by struggle and, and obstacles, sometimes God will push you from behind and have you experience success faster than you're able to manage it so that you stumble, so that you finally learn the lesson he was trying to tell you back when you were struggling. Okay, you're not going to listen to me while you're struggling? Let's have you succeed for a while and then see how you handle that without the maturity I'm trying to give you. Very important lesson. Anyways, I'm off my notes. Let me get back to my notes. Um, Let's go back to the Talmud to get back centered on this text here. We have this idea that uh, Joshua is proclaiming in frustration, really. I mean, this is the first real setback of Joshua's leadership, right? Moses went through this, didn't he? Moses had this happen to him. We read the book of Numbers. We had, we had rebellion that rised up against Moses where God had to swallow people into the earth to stop it. Moses was challenged. People were, people were coming and saying, why do you get to have all the glory? You're no better than us. You know, what makes you the one that gets to say, speak for God? Aren't we all prophets? Isn't all of Israel prophets? Well, here's Joshua now. Joshua's facing his first test of leadership. Things didn't go well on the battlefield. There's sin in the camp. Let's go back to the Talmud, the Sanhedrin, to our second reading from that passage. And we're going to see something pretty cool here. Once I find it, I have it marked. It says in, uh, again, we're in folio 44. Rav Nachman says that, Rav says, what is the meaning of that which is written? The poor man speaks in treaties, but the rich man answers with impudence. Proverbs 18.23. The poor man speaks in treaties. This is a reference to Moses, who addressed God in a tone of supplication and appeasement. The rich man answers with impudence. This is a reference to Joshua, who spoke to God in a belligerent manner. Whoa, this is intense. The Gemara asks, what is the reason that Joshua is considered to have answered God with impudence? If we say that it is because it is written, and he laid them out before the Lord. And Rav Nachman says that this means that Joshua came and cast the spoils down before God as part of his argument. This is difficult. Is that to say that Peneus did not act the same way in the incident involving Zimri and Cosby. As it is written, then stood up Peneus and executed judgment, and the plague was stayed, Psalm 106, 30. And Rabbi Eliezer says, and he prayed, is it not stated rather, and he executed judgment? It's stated which teaches that he entered into a judgment together with his creator. How so? He came and cast Zimri and Cosby down before God, just like they're, they're paralleling Joshua throwing the spoils down with Phineas. Anyways, you guys get it. It says, Master of the universe, was it because of these sinners that 24,000 members of the Jewish people fell? As it is written, and those that died by the plague were 24,000, Numbers 25.9. Rather, Joshua's belligerence is seen from this verse. Why have you brought this people over the Jordan? Joshua 7.7. 7. As if he were complaining about God's treatment of Israel. This too is difficult. As Moses also said a similar statement, Why have you dealt ill with this people? Why is it that you have sent me? Exodus 5.22. Rather, Joshua's belligerence is seen from here, from the continuation of the previously cited verse in Joshua, Would that we had been content and had remained across the Jordan, Joshua 7.7. 7. So this is, um, this is interesting. This is interesting, this journey that the sages are taking us on. So we started off with a single man who was declared unrighteous. He's violating the Torah. A single man causes the death of 36 righteous people. And now God is is looking at the whole camp, and now he's not only fingering the whole nation and saying all of Israel's sin. This is how he opens up this chapter. God didn't say that you have somebody in your camp that sinned. God says all Israel has sinned. And not only that, now Joshua himself is being fingered as a culprit. Boy, this is starting to sound like the book of Job. This is very interesting. 
Joshua goes on and says before the Lord in verse 8, he says, O Lord, what shall I say after Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? This is amazing because we're going to see a rabbinic parallel here that I'm going to share with you that I think will help illustrate what's going on here. It says, a king had a small key for his palace. Said the king, if I leave it as it is, uh, Jeremy quotes uh, Proverbs 37 through 9. Yes, earlier. Said the king, a king had a small key for his palace. Said the king, if I leave it as it is, it will be lost. I shall rather make a chain for it. For it would, if it would get lost, the chain will be attached to it. So said the most holy, blessed be he. If I leave Israel as they are, they will be swallowed up among the nations. I shall rather incorporate my great name in them, and they will remain alive as it is written. And what will you do for your great name? This is quoting the Yalkut Shimoni. <coughs> and there's a commentary on this parable from the Perush Hakofeb, if I said that right, which I probably didn't. It says, Israel is the small key to the entire world, the guard and preserver of the whole creation. But because of their small number, they are likely to be swallowed up among the nations of the world. Therefore, the Lord attached his great name to his nation. When Israel turned their backs and fled from the small army of Ai, there resulted, resulted in a profanation of the holy name of God. Now, this parable speaks of a massively important concept within Judaism which helps us understand why Israel has been chased all over the globe for 2,000 years. I'm not going to get into it right now, but when we get back into section two of the, of the Derek Hashem session, which will be coming, we're going to get into this in great depth. The Ram Kal goes into tremendous depth of explanation as to why there are the Jews and why there are the 70 nations. And it has to do in part with this idea, the idea of protecting the Jewish people from being annihilated by the sheer numbers of their enemies. God's name is attached to Israel. Therefore, even when Israel sins, God will defend his name. This is an important idea. Even when you and I fall short, our devakut to Hashem is a form of protection because he will guard and protect his name. Even though it feels like sometimes he's not doing so, he does. Even when you feel like you're being judged, that judgment is more than likely being mitigated in many ways from what it could be. I don't deserve to sit here and teach. I don't, but by God's grace, here I am. I mean, it sounds trite, but that's the truth. We're all able to do what we do and pursue. Even though we have many complaints about how our life should be, we all have many blessings about how our life is that we get to participate in. Things that we get to do, choices we get to make, people we get to love, things that we have the opportunity to be part of that is strictly not anything that we deserve by the merits of our deeds, but yet are attributed to us as another opportunity to pass the test, the daily moment-by-moment -moment test that enables us to elevate our godly soul. And of course, we have to see that this is part of what's going on here in Joshua. God is not masochistic. He's not taking pleasure in seeing people die off and killed and punished. But there's lessons that the people need to learn if they're going to function in his presence and among the nations. It's very important. We have to see that. We also have lessons to learn before we can move on. Sometimes those lessons take decades for us to learn. I know this firsthand, as we all do. So in verse 10, God we read, answers Joshua. <laughs> and he says, get up. Why do you fall on your face? 
God actually tells Joshua that it's his fault that this happened to begin with. And you're thinking, what in the world did Joshua do? What, how could Joshua be at fault here? Well, let's look at the Talmud again. And let's, let's, let's consider this. This is really fascinating. I think it's going to be a lesson for all of us in fundamentalism. So, uh, do I have the right reading here? Yes. Reading in the Talmud, in folio 43a, 43, uh, yeah, no, 44a, excuse me. If so, what is the meaning when the verse states, get you up, hinting that Joshua was in fact responsible for some transgression? The matter should be understood as follows. God said to Joshua, you caused the Jewish people to sin, as had you not dedicated all the spoils of Jericho to the tabernacle treasury, the entire incident of Achan, of Achan, taking the spoils uh, improperly would not have occurred. And this is what God said to him at Ai. And you shall do to Ai and her king as you did to Jericho and her king. Only its spoil and its cattle shall you take for a prey for yourselves. Joshua 8, 2. So now, we're not going to get to it, but in the beginning of chapter 8, right, Joshua tells people the opposite instructions he gave them when they entered Jericho. Before they go into Jericho, Joshua says, you shall not touch anything. But then when they go into the next phase of their journey, he says they can take spoil. And it's right from God. But God says to Joshua, I didn't tell you to tell them not to take any spoil. But guess what God does? He honors Joshua's commandment. Think about that. Think about that. Joshua, as the leader of the people, is an edict, a decree. God honors it. Where else do we see this happen? Remember when King Saul becomes king? And he has a battle. And he makes this awful decree that no man can eat until the battle is complete. And his men are passing out on the way from, from hunger and thirst. Jonathan finally rebukes the whole situation, saying, why are we suffering like this? But yet, the decree was issued. The decree was issued. Remember when Hezekiah, in horrible fashion, shows the warehouses of the temple to the foreigners that come to visit? And the prophet comes to him and says, because you have done this, it will all be taken away. And Hezekiah repents. He covers himself and sat in a sackcloth, but the decree is fulfilled because he's the king. This is just an amazing thing. So God says to Joshua, hey, leader of the people, guess who gets to carry the weight of this loss of life? Sounds just like David. David goes before the Lord and the Lord tells him, you got three choices here. They're all bad. Make your choice because you took a census. They're all bad. Someone's going to die. It reminds me of that movie, National Treasure. You know, the guy comes and he sits with Nicolas Cage at the end of the movie. And he's like, somebody's going to go to jail here. Who's it going to be? Somebody has to go to jail. That's the law. Who's it going to be? This is a scary thing for us to consider. We should not be so quick to cast people into the judgment seat. This is the principle of binding and loosing, isn't it? We see this in Matthew 18, 18, don't we? It says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall will have, will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know, evangelicals think this is talking about demonic warfare. It's talking about the principle of binding and loosing, which has to do with 
that which is on earth is that it is as in heaven. This is what God is honoring here. This is what God's telling Joshua. You bound these men. I'm honoring that. And here's the result. Next time, don't make a decree like that without checking with me, basically, is what the sages say in the Talmud. All right. Just add to your list of examples there the vow of Jephthah and Judges regarding sacrificing his daughter. That's a beautiful example. I didn't even think of that. Thank you, Jeremy. That's, that's actually a better example. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a, talk about a tragedy. Talk about a tragedy of epic proportions. Jephthah's awful vow. The first thing that I see when I walk out my door will be dedicated to destruction. And it's his precious daughter. Horrible. But yeah. And it had to be honored, right? It had to be honored. Very scary idea. Vows and oaths are a big deal. Big deal. All right. So we have this rabbinic principle that is now illustrated here through this teaching. But now we get to verse 11. It says, Israel has sinned. So the, the commentary says, although one individual has committed a crime, communal responsibility and guilt must be recognized now that they have crossed the Jordan, as I already mentioned earlier. Now contrast this entire conversation of the Jewish concept of a collective soul and the concept of communal redemption and accountability versus the Protestant concept of individual salvation. And understand, for those who don't know church history, the idea of getting saved, born again, doesn't exist as a front and center concept in church history until the great preachers, revivalist preachers and tent revival meetings that happened about 150 years ago. That's when this became popularized. This whole idea of individual salvation, something that where, where the church becomes something other than an organized whole, where spirituality becomes something very individualistic, not connected to the greater community. That's one aspect of this concept of individual spirituality, that I, I, can, I can be close to God. I don't have to connect to anybody. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to deal with anybody. I can just sit at home and I can study texts. I can read my books. I can make Facebook posts and I can be super spiritual. And not only will I become super spiritual, I'm going to lay waste to anyone that dares come against my tower of impenetrability. And this is what happens when people try to do spirituality outside the framework of God's order is we become proud and arrogant, and we lose our sense of connectiveness. God doesn't mean for us to be spiritual alone. He means for us to connect to people, right? That's what his community is. And in the same way, when God deals with his people, yes, yes, there is individual accountability. Yes, there is individual free will choice and all that. But there's also this neglected aspect that God is going to pay for what he orders. When God makes a covenant, he's going to see that covenant through, even though our eyes, our judgment, looks and says, no way, God. No way are you going to save all them. Look at the, look at the way they live. For crying out loud, they voted for Obama. That was a joke for Jeremy. The, um, you say the same thing in reverse. But the, the idea... The, well, I'm, I'm being funny, but I mean, the idea that we, we, we judge people based on our own criteria, and many times we're right, but we're not in the place of doing that. The Jewish people are a collective soul. So if you're not Jewish, then the best thing you can do to enhance your spirituality is to assist the Jewish people in the tikkun. How can you do that? By being righteous. Be a righteous of the nations. And you're assisting the Jewish people in their job description. I don't want to get off on that because that's a whole other topic. But just as a point of reference, there's a lot of Facebook groups out there. This is one of them. 
you got to be careful when you get all your instruction from people that are sitting in their study alone with piles of books around them, randomly opening up books that they haven't even read yet and grabbing a two paragraph quote out of it and constructing a blog. And saying, oh, this is what this means. And making all these connections. Just be careful because that isn't spirituality. That's navel gazing. That's picking lint out of your belly button. It doesn't mean it doesn't have any value. I've done it. I've written blogs where I've pulled things from left and right field. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that even myself, right? I've had people say, oh, Dave, that, that thing you wrote, man, that was just so awesome. That was so great. I don't know why they think it was great. Sometimes people think that something I wrote was great. And when I actually listened to it, explain to me what they got out of it, it wasn't even anything I was intending on saying. And I, I'm just like, I'm, like, I'm going to agree with them because they're telling me I'm great. So, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad you saw that. that. Yeah, that was something I really wanted to. I, I have no idea what they're talking about. I didn't even mean to say that. I just, we just got to be careful. Anyways, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm rambling at this point. Let me go back. Let's, let's finish this up. But just, I'm just saying there's a collectiveness. We're seeing this lesson here in this chapter. It's overwhelmingly here in this chapter that we've got a leader who is being held to account, even though by our reading from a surface level, Joshua is not guilty of anything. It was a con. A con's the one. Uh, he's the one that brought all this trouble on Israel. Well, yeah, he did bring some trouble on Israel. He's going to be the scapegoat here. He's going to be the focal point. But he's not the only one being affected. Joshua's leadership is being affected. 36 righteous equivalent to the Sanhedrin have been killed in battle. Unnecessarily. Tragic. And the nation's going to have to deal with it. And they're going to make adjustments as a result of all of it. And we're going to see something even more amazing as we wrap this up, as we look at Achan and, and uh, Achan. I've said his name like six different ways here in the study. You guys pick whichever way you want to say it. It says, Achan, Achan thank you. Okay, I'll say it that way. That, that works. Joshua said to Achan, give glory to the Lord and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide anything from me. Because this in verse 13, it says, there was an accursed thing in your midst. And then verse 19, he says what I just read. So let's go now and let's look at the Talmud again. There's an accursed thing in your midst. Going back backwards in the Talmud to page 43, second side, we're going to look at something else here. It says, the Gemara asks, if so, what is the reason that the Jewish people were not punished on Achan's account until now? I'm getting it, Jeremy. Rabbi Yochanan says in the name of Rabbi Eleazar, son of Rabbi Shimon, because God did not punish the nation as a whole for hidden sins committed by individuals until the Jewish people crossed the Jordan River, which I read earlier. The Gemara notes that this is subject to a dispute between the Ta'anim. The verse states, the hidden matters belong to the Lord our God, but those matters that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the Torah, Deuteronomy 29, 28. Why in a Torah scroll are there dots over each of the letters of the words to us and to our children, and over the letter ayin in the word forever, the dots which function like erasers that weaken the force of the words teach that God did not punish the nation for hidden sins until the Jewish people crossed the Jordan River. This is the statement of Rabbi Yehuda. Okay, I mentioned that earlier, but here's where it applies. And then when we get to uh, verse 19, it says, very interestingly, give glory to the Lord and make confession to him. Tell me now what you have done. Do not hide anything from me. Why? Because even those with a death sentence in Jewish law are required to confess. Why? For their atonement. And you might think, well, they're going to be killed. Isn't that their atonement? There must be an acknowledgement by the soul of the person who is the judgment is being enacted upon that they will merit a place in the world to come. This is a very important principle in Jewish thinking. 
uh, Jeremy and I took a class uh, in uh, the fall called Crime and Punishment from Jewish Learning Institute. It was excellent, outstanding course. And it talked about this. It talked about the idea of confessing before the death penalty is enacted. It was making an argument pro and con about the death penalty based on Jewish law. It was a really fascinating class. That was one aspect of the class. And I want to read this now uh, as we get back into the Talmud and Tractate Sanhedrin. I'm going to read the source where that is talked about. And it says here that apropos the last verse cited in this Bereta, Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi said, with regard to anyone who slaughters his evil inclination after it has tempted him to sin, if he repents and confesses his sin, the verse ascribes him credit as though he had honored the Holy One. Blessed be he in two worlds. <coughs> Excuse me, two worlds. Here's the liquid, hold on. This world and the world to come, as it is written, Whoever slaughters a thanksgiving offering honors me, Psalm 50, 23, which can also be read as whoever slaughters his evil inclination and confesses honors me. And the two instances of the letter Nun in the word Yechad Danini, Danini, if I said that right, allude to the two worlds. And Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi also says, when the temple is standing, if a person sacrifices a burnt offering, he has the reward given for bringing a burnt offering. And if he sacrifices a meal offering, he has the reward, reward given for bringing a meal offering. Notice here that the sacrifices themselves are not providing the atonement, but it's the confession and the intent related to them. You see that? Okay, anyways. But as for the one whose spirit is humble, this verse ascribes him credit for his prayer as though he has sacrificed all the offerings. As it is stated, the offerings of God are a broken spirit. Psalm 51, 19, which teaches that a broken spirit is equivalent to the offerings to God in the plural. And moreover, his prayer is not rejected as it is stated in the continuation of that verse, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And the Mishnah then goes on as a Mishnah. And the Mishnah states when the condemned, and this is what was quoted in the JLI course, when the condemned man is at a distance of about 10 cubits from the place of stoning, they say to him, confess your transgressions. As the way of all who are being executed is to confess. And whoever confesses and regrets his transgressions has a portion in the world to come. For so we find with regard to Achan, Achan, that Joshua said to him, My son, please give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. Joshua 7, 19. And the next verse states, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and like this and like that have I done. And from where is it derived that Achan's confession achieved atonement for him? It is derived from here, as it is stated, and Joshua said, Why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord shall trouble you this day, Joshua 7.25. Joshua said to Achan as follows, On this day of your judgment you are troubled, but you will not be troubled in the world to come. And if the condemned man does not know how to confess, either from ignorance or out of confusion, they say to him, this was also dealt with in the JLI class in brilliant fashion, say simply, let my death be an atonement for all my sins. Rabbi Yehuda says, if the condemned man knows that he was convicted by the testimony of conspiring witnesses, but in fact he is innocent, he says, let my death be an atonement for all my sins except for this sin. The sages who disagreed with Rabbi Yehuda said to him, if so, every person who is being executed will say that to clear himself in the eyes of the public. Therefore, if the condemned man does not make such a statement on his own, the court does not suggest it to him as an alternative. Then the Gemara, commenting on this Mishnah, I'll just read a couple paragraphs of the Gemara. It says, since the Mishnah referred to Achan's sin, the Gemara cites several statements concerning that incident. The sages taught in a Bereta, Joshua said to Achan, please give glory to God, the Lord, the Lord, God of Israel, and make confession to him. The word na is nothing other than an expression of supplication. Why would Joshua employ an expression of supplication when approaching Achan? The Bereta explains, 
When the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Joshua, Israel has sinned, Joshua said to him, Master of the universe, who is the one who has sinned? God said to him, Am I an informer? Go cast lots and find out for yourself. Joshua then went and cast lots, and the lot fell upon Achan. Achan said to him, this is fascinating, Joshua, do you come to execute me merely based on lots, without any corroborating evidence? You and Eleazar are the priests of the two most distinguished leaders of the generation. But if I cast a lot upon the two of you, it will perforce fall upon one of you. What then can you prove from a lottery? Joshua said to him, I ask of you, do not spread slander about the lots, as Eretz Yisrael will one day be divided by lots. As it is stated, nevertheless, the land shall be divided by lots. Numbers 26.55 Due to you, the results of that lottery may be challenged. Therefore, Joshua used the word na, pleading with Achan to confess. Joshua said to Achan, please give the glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make confession to him. Ravina says Joshua won over Achan with his words, saying, do we ask anything of you but a confession? Make confession to him and be discharged. Thinking that if he confessed, he would be pardoned, Achan immediately responded, and Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel, and like this and like that have I done. It says in the notes that in the Rambam's commentary on the Mishnah, it says that Achan's execution was an extra legal punishment necessitated by unusually pressing circumstances, as according to Halakha, one cannot be executed based on his own confession or have his guilt determined by a lottery. We also covered that in that course, which was interesting. So anyways, fascinating commentary here of, this, of the rabbis wrestling with this whole incident and the results of it and the implications upon Israel's future. Hidden sins are not judged unless you're taking on the full weight of the law. You know, we, we see the Apostle Paul mention this in the book of Romans when he says, what benefit of those, of those under the law? Well, great in every respect because the Jews have the covenants, the responsibilities of interpretation, all the blessings that go with it. But when you're under the law, you're, you're under the full weight of the responsibility of the covenant. So it's not a flippant thing. People wandering around saying, well, I'm Jewish because I say I am. You know, I'm just going to declare myself Jewish because I'm one of the lost tribes. No, <laughs> you're Jewish when a legal Jewish body says you're Jewish and not a moment before. You might be spiritually, and a rabbi will tell you that, you know, I consider you Jewish, but you still have to go through the process of making it legal before you can publicly say that. And that's, why does it matter? It matters because of the stuff we're talking about in this chapter. You realize that you, you're entering into a covenant relationship. The Jewish people are in covenant with God. You may not agree with Judaism. You may not agree with the rabbis. You may not agree with the halakha. But understand that it's not your place to have an opinion about it if you're not part of the nation. The rabbis were given a responsibility to steward the nation, for better or for worse. It's like a marriage. You know, does your wife or husband always do things that make you happy every moment of the day? No. Do you divorce them just because you get unhappy for a moment? Well, hopefully not. I mean, it does happen. But you, you marry for the long haul. You put up. And sometimes you shut up because you got to. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is, you know. People, people say, oh, those crazy Jews, you know. Half of them don't even believe in God. Okay, does that mean God's not going to be faithful to them just because they currently don't believe in God? Maybe they will. Maybe, maybe after they listen to this class, they will. Who knows? Maybe this class is the secret for them. Who knows? Probably not. But you just don't know. You don't know where people are headed, but God does. That's my point with that. So then it says in verse 21, we're wrapping up here. When I saw among the spoils, this is Achan, Achan's confession. This, this is his excuse. He says in verse 21, if you read it, let's turn to it. 
This is interesting. Verse 21, what does Achan say? He says, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish, Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, and I coveted them. Um, oh, okay, Michael, I got your message. That's good. Uh, that's exciting, actually. And 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. And then he says, and behold, they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now, it says in the Talmud that he quotes the Torah for justification for his action. Again, I'm not trying to necessarily make this about beating up on Hebrew roots or anything, but many people out there will say, well, I read it in the Torah. This is what it says, literally. And therefore, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And no rabbi or anyone else can tell me otherwise. I don't care what the Jews say. This is what it says in the Torah. So if they're telling you something different, it's because they're lying. Synagogue of Satan, they don't, you know, don't trust them. The whole works. Okay, that's called being a biblicist. It's a form of fundamentalism that always creates division. All right? We have this movement called the Karite movement. Karite movement is considered a heresy by rabbinic Judaism. Why? Because the Karites say that they will determine what Torah observance is supposed to look like, and they don't care what the rabbis have to say about it. They're going to determine their own calendar. They're going to do things, and they have a lot of overlapping similarities, of course, but there's, there's differences, and they justify them as saying, well, we're going, to, we're going to go by the written Torah. We're not going to go by the rulings of the sages. That will get you in trouble. Again, you're, you're part of a community. We don't have the right to determine our own interpretation on law. The halakha is the halakha. When the messianic age starts, or perhaps even sooner than that, when Israel fully is sovereign and the temple is reestablished and the Sanhedrin is back in force, the halakha can be fluid again and things can be revisited and debates can ensue. But until that happens, the Sanhedrin has been in exile for well over hundreds and hundreds of years. But customs develop, minhag develops, traditions develop, but the halakha is set. It can only be interpreted. So anyways, that's a small point in the scope of the study, but it was worth making, I think. So finally, we're going to end up with a couple last readings here for the Talmud. It says in verse 24, Joshua took Achan. And now let's look at another portion here that speaks of this. It says, with regard to the spoils that Achan took for himself, we're going to give an explanation to what I just told you. The verse states, and they laid them out before the Lord. And Rav Nachman says, Joshua came and cast down the spoils before God. Joshua said to him, master of the universe, was it because of these small items that the majority of the Sanhedrin were killed? As it is written, and the men of eyes smote about them, these 36 men. All right. So Achan's like, really? 36 men had to die because of this trifling matter? Really? Isn't that sometimes how people evaluate God's actions? Like, if God's so powerful, why does he allow so much suffering in the world? If God's so powerful, why, why are these people over here allowed to do what they do? How come he doesn't just fix it? Why? You know, these types of questions, these difficulties. They're not insignificant questions. Maybe God wants us to ask the question. Maybe that's why they're happening. Maybe he wants us to fight and intercede on behalf of the less powerful. Maybe that's our job. Maybe we see the inequity because we're supposed to do something about it. That could be. So as we finish here, why have you troubled us? Joshua says to Achan, the Lord shall trouble you this day. And we've discussed in this study about the idea of a collective responsibility. But then in protest, we would say, uh, uh, Michael makes a comment. He says, yet we continue to see those in two house, sacred name, et cetera, et cetera, that do these things you were speaking of. Well, yeah, that's why I mentioned it. I mentioned it because 
you know, all they, all these things do is that you know, people rally around a small group of people, but they end up dividing away, and it's, it's just a splintering. There's this constant splintering of little groups that splinter off, and they're all just ultimately they're all going to find themselves at the same place. They're all going to eventually be like you know that that cartoon. Uh, from Warner Brothers, where you got Bugs Money and the Martian, you know, and and the Martian just keeps blowing up more and more of the of the moon because he he doesn't want to share it with Bugs Bunny until finally they're standing in this little tiny chunk of Earth, and he says there isn't room on this for the two of us. And that's where these splinter groups go. They end up, they just devolve into just infighting, division. People get hurt. Before you know it, you get families that have been cast out of five different fellowships, and they don't want anything to do with religion anymore. That's what happens. <coughs> God's not glorified in that regardless of whether opinions are shared or people are right or wrong, it doesn't even matter. At some point, at a human level, there's a human suffering and loss that happens. But what about Ezekiel 18? One would say, well, Ezekiel 18 says that no man suffers for another man's sin, but we are all judged for our own sins. The children are not going to have their teeth set on edge for the sins of the parents. The children are going to deal with their own sin. And if they confess and walk in righteousness, they'll result, they'll result in the blessing from that. And if the parents confess their wickedness, they'll, they'll reap from that. The children aren't going to suffer for the parents. That's what Ezekiel 18 says. So where does that fit into this whole discussion? Where does it? Is that a separate issue? Is the Bible arguing with itself here? Any comments? Any thoughts? I don't have notes on this. I just wanted this to be a discussion point, if you guys are interested. I have only one more note. No? Okay. I just think it's worth thinking about. You know, I don't agree with the Christian teaching that by the shed blood of Jesus that the whole world is atoned for. I don't believe in the, in the Christian notion of human sacrifice for atonement. <clears throat> Nor do I believe that he's God. People say, well, if he isn't God, then how does he atone for our sins? Which is the most convoluted pretzel logic I can possibly imagine. I don't even want to address it. But the argument against the idea of atonement in that manner, in terms of a Zodic atoning for a, for a generation, is the idea that Ezekiel 18, and yet we have in Jewish teaching, we have the idea that a righteous one, if he's significantly righteous, that his very righteousness is a source of atonement. Because why? Because they're all one soul. So if I attach to a Zodic, I'm attaching to what they call in Kabbalah a root soul. I'm attaching to a root soul which elevates my soul and helps me achieve devachut. And it does teach within Judaism that the death of a Zadokim, of the Zadokim, it accomplishes great atonement for his generation, even beyond the borders of his own community. Okay, so, so what are we dealing with here? We're certainly not talking about human sacrifice for sin. The idea within Christianity of, of, of the, you know, the, the death of Jesus replacing the sacrifice, sacrificial system is patently absurd. They don't have anything to do with each other whatsoever. There's also many other problems I have with the gospel presentation of this event. Um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But it doesn't mean, you know, sometimes you'll listen to an anti-missionary who will say that, well, the whole idea is absurd to begin with. The idea that a person could die for others. Well, not as a sacrifice. I would agree with the anti-missionaries in that respect. But it's not true that Judaism doesn't teach that righteous people of, of the nation don't. Pro I mean, all we have to do is look in the Tanakh. Right? Moses, not that Moses died for the people, but Moses intercedes on behalf of the people, and because of his righteousness, the people are forgiven. Abraham, we saw at the beginning of the study, Abraham prophetically looked ahead and he interceded for the people. We see it in the book of Job. 
Job, a man who was supposedly not a Jew at all, who offered sacrifices on behalf of his children, lest they, lest they had sinned. So this is a concept that exists in, in biblical history. Let's end with uh, the last reading from the Talmud. From this powerful tractate in Sanhe uh, called Sanhedrin. I can find it here. Oh, I must have gone by it. Bear with me. Where is it? There we go. So why is a Khan judged? Why is he singled out? If everybody's a collective soul and all Israel in some respect sinned and even Joshua was at fault ultimately according to God for his crazy edict. It says here in the Talmud that with regard to Achan, the verse states, and because he has committed a wanton deed in Israel, Joshua 7.15, Rabbi Abba Bar Zavda says, this teaches that Achan engaged in sexual intercourse with a betrothed young woman. They're like I'm like, okay, so where does this come from? This offense is also alluded to by the wording of the verse. Here, with regard to Achan, it is written, and because he has committed a wanton deed, and there, with regard to a betrothed young woman who committed adultery, it is written, because she has committed a wanton deed in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. Deuteronomy 22.21. The Gemara asks, isn't this obvious as Akan transgressed the entire Torah? The Gemara similarly answers, lest you say that he did not act irreverently to such an extent, Rabbi Abar, uh, Abba Bar Zavda teaches us that he paid no heed even to this prohibition. Ravina said the verbal analogy does not teach what Akan's offense was. Rather, it teaches that his punishment was like that of a betrothed young woman who committed adultery for, for which she is executed by stoning. So it's connecting the, the death of Joshua to the punishment attributed in the Torah for that offense. The Exilarch says, uh, Exilarch, uh, Jeremy help me with that, said to Rav Huna, it is written, and Joshua took Achan, son of Zerah, and the silver and the mantle and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had and all Israel with him. And all Israel stoned him with stones and they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. Joshua seven twenty four through 25. If Achan sinned so that he was liable to be stoned, did his sons and daughters also sin that they too should be stoned? Here we go. We're back to Ezekiel 18 again. Rav Huna said to the Exilarch, and according to your reasoning that Achan's family was also punished, if Achan sinned, did all of Israel sin? As it is written in the, in the Bible, and all Israel with him, rather Joshua took all the people to the valley of Achor not to stone them, but to chastise them and strike fear into their hearts by making them witness the stoning. So too he took Achan's household there in order to chastise them. With regard to Achan's punishment, the verse states, and they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. The Gemara asks, did they punish him with two punishments? Ravina says, that which was fit for burning, an item of clothing, was taken out for burning, and that which was fit for stoning was taken out for stoning. So understand that it's tempting to look and say, well, this is just unjust. The guy made a mistake, okay? He had an error of judgment. Maybe he lost his mind for a minute. And he committed this sin. And so God is telling Joshua, well, you know, you're partially responsible for this because of your decree. You put people in an impossible situation. How could you basically telling them that you tempted them in something that, really shouldn't have been a prohibition by making it a prohibition. And then you have the rabbis reflecting upon themselves really there. And then you have, then you have this situation where it's okay. So we have a collective soul, all Israel sinned, but yet all Israel does isn't stoned. But a Khan, the one who perpetrates the act is judged according to the Torah and he is stoned. But we also see, contrary to those who want to say that the Torah is just horrible, how can you have all these rules where you could literally stone somebody for committing one of these acts? I mean, how, how 
unjust, how inhumane to have the death penalty. Yet we see that in the midst of the confession, he gains the world to come. So what's, what's the future of Achan? Where, does, where is his soul going to be? In the bosom of Abraham. Then he's going to experience the world to come, the ultimate bliss. You think, well, wait a minute now. So we can't have it both ways. So first you're going to tell me that God is unjust by punishing this man. And then you're going to say that, well, how does he get off gaining the world to come? Look at the evil that he did. This is one of the things that we dealt with in the JLI course, Crime and Punishment. It talked about the idea that our current judicial system is rigged to, to satisfy our bloodlust for retribution. We don't rehabilitate people in America. We throw them in prison and throw away the key. And we give a token probation to make to assuage our own guilt of our own sense of inhumane, inhumane treatment, only they're treated so horribly in prison with no rehabilitation, no education. They come out, they can't get a job because nobody's going to hire them because they got a criminal rap sheet. So they're unemployed, they can't make any money, they can't support a family. What would you do in that situation? How would you make money? You know what a lot of them do? Crying out loud, I need, to, I need to get a car, I need to support my wife go right back to the crime that put them in jail because they have access to it. They know the contacts, they know where to get it. And they figure this time I won't get caught. And all they're trying to do is what every red blooded person would like to do. And that's do what's right and work and provide for their family. I'm not saying they all have this motivation, but we learned in that class that our judicial system is not righteous. According to the Torah, one of the prime responsibilities of the nations is to set up righteous courts of justice. You realize we're failing that here in America. Our courts are failing at their job because we are throwing able-bodied people in prison for interminable amounts of time and ruining their lives without any attempt to retrain them and rehabilitate them. The path of Torah is to rehabilitate and reclaim people's dignity, not to punish them forever and play God. So we look at Achan, and we're tempted to argue out both sides of our mouth. God, you're being so unjust by punishing this man. God, you're being so unjust by giving this man world to come. Olam haba. Which is it? Heaven forbid we should call Hashem unjust. Right? So we have some soul searching to do as we figure out this concept of collective atonement. We got Yom Kippur is coming up. Yom Kippur is coming up. What does it mean if you've been raised Christian? What does it mean for the Jewish people to collectively fast and pray as a collective community before God for atonement? What does that mean in our understanding of atonement? I, I can tell you right now it means something much different to a Jew than it means to an evangelical Christian. I'm not trying to denigrate the Christian. I'm simply saying that this concept needs to be reworked. We need to do some work. We need to figure it out. And it's not necessarily an either or proposition either. This both end. The both end thing going on here. So let's end here. Uh, hey, Lorna. Thank you. Great to see you tonight. Uh, Jeremy said, whenever you said it, all Israel is accountable to one another. I don't know when you typed that, but it's a good comment. Um, so let's, let's end it. Uh, any, uh, any last comments from anybody, any reflections before I stop the recording? I, I can stay on for a few minutes and chat for those who want to. Any two cents you guys been waiting for me to finish my monologue so you can share. Nope. Okay. No problem. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to end the recording and I'll, I'll stick around for those who want to hang out and we can chat for a bit.